bear 8-9 backpack just caught a salmon as well. And um, I'm not sure if Mike has it in the frame, but uh, we're, there, these bears here are catching salmon and bear 812 just caught another one. This is happy news, Mike. Yeah, so an indication that more salmon are moving through uh, the river right now. We were seeing uh, bears earlier in the day catching fish uh, downstream of Brooks Falls too. The topography of the waterfall, really, if you're not familiar with this place, makes the salmon vulnerable to bears. If, if the waterfall wasn't here, it'd be much more difficult for bears to catch salmon in this place. There would be a lot more running around for bears. A lot of what we see downstream, and uh, you wouldn't see bears like standing around waiting for the fish to come to them. But the, the waterfall allows that to happen. So it's a little bit of an accident of geology that's giving 89 backpack here that chance to sit and wait for Santa to come to him. And then if I'll uh, back out of our view here quickly and then take a look at number 812. A lot of times people are want, ask, well, how do you recognize certain bears? And certainly physical features are important, but another way that you can recognize individual bears is by their behavioral characteristics. And 812, perhaps more than any other bear, likes to eat his salmon on a table. If he's fishing the lip, he frequently will go to those rocks and eat his salmon right there. So other bears that are fishing the lip, again, if you're looking to learn some of these individual bears and recognize them on the cameras, look for that behavior from 812. That's one of the ways that you can recognize him compared to other bears. It's certainly one of the ways that I recognize 812. He likes to have his dinner on that rock table back there. And sometimes I've had trouble distinguishing 812 from 503. And that behavior tells me that that's 812. Now, a little bit of grumbling on the other side here. It looks, uh, so we missed most of that. But what happened is uh, number 89, who's back in his fishing spot, closer to us in, the, in your view, wasn't quite done with his salmon. Uh, but he didn't want to lose his fishing spot uh, to number 83. So he ended up dropping the fish, moving back into his fishing spot. But 83, being the opportunist that he is, ended up uh, scavenging the rest of that leftover salmon. And 83, uh, he seems to be quite hungry because uh, he, he took down the rest of uh, backpack salmon in just uh, a few bites. And we don't think of stealing as a legitimate uh, <laughs> occupation. But um, for these bears, when they're hungry, um, stealing is one way they fish. Yeah, one of the things that we can use to describe brown bears, describe behavior well, but not decouple the any sort of like or uh, like associations prepared with his words, for instance, like uh, stealing or pirating. Again, in the human world, generally not something that's uh, is considered acceptable. But in the bear world, it certainly is. In um, also, when you see bears pushing each other around Brooks Falls, it really is one bullying. But it's not something that, um, you know, bullying in the human world is not something that's susceptible, but that bears do. That's how they interact with one another. So we just can't necessarily, uh, you know, stigmatize these animals based on what we were perceive and to how they should behave based on human uh, ethics and morals. Right. And now, really kind of like a, <laughs> A, a nice vocal exchange going on here between 89 and 83. They both want to fish in that spot. Growling is a way that bears try to intimidate uh, each other, so you'll frequently hear growling when bears are close to each other, especially if they, they are kind of evenly matched. Uh, in the hierarchy. That's, it, it, it happens with the more dominant bears, but more evenly matched bears, it seems to happen to uh, uh, more often. And it seems now that there there have been fewer salmon and the bears are very hungry, it's, it's happening more often. And with bears that might not necessarily uh, growl at each other like that, like 89 Backpack doesn't typically do that. He might yield to 8-3. Um, if there were more salmon around, but um, every salmon is important to him right now. And he just got another one. Right, and you can see why it was important for 89 to hold his spot over there. Uh, if he had moved away, he wouldn't have got that fish. 
Now, it's hard to defend your fishing spot and eat your catch. So oftentimes we see bears moving away out of those fishing spots. Sometimes we'll see them eating right in the fishing spot. Uh, but that's, that happens most often with the, the biggest, most dominant bears. And while 89 and 83 aren't small guys, they're not nearly as big as some of the other really dominant bears that we have here. Now, it would be interesting to see what happens, Naomi, once 89 fishes his, or finishes with his salmon, whether he's gonna go back into that spot and challenge 83 for it, or if he's gonna to try to move to a different location. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll watch that because it would, will be interesting. I, if I were 89 backpack, I'd wanna go back to where I found that fish again. <clears throat> we're also seeing that the bears this evening and over the past few days are eating the, the whole entire fish for the most part. They're leaving virtually nothing behind except for some of the entrails. And that's an indication that they're all very hungry. When we start to see more and more salmon come into the river and the bear's stomachs start to get full, then we'll start to see the bears become more selective in their eating habits. So they'll eat the fattier parts of the fish, the skin, the brain, and the eggs. But don't expect to see that tonight. There's just been too few salmon in the river so far this year. So 89, done with this fish. Looks like he may want to move back to that spot, but again, 83 is right there, so we'll see how these two bears settle their differences. Most bears don't want to fight, although they will, but they, they, try, to, they try to resolve their differences without coming to, the, coming to a physical fight. Yeah, injury can um, be very damaging to a bear in a season. Uh, they heal well, they're resilient, but um, when your job number one is to get fat, uh, an injury could put you out of commission for a little bit. So much better to argue than to fight. And looking at this prolonged sort of growling between these bears, you can see that 83 has his back, back turned to number 89. Again, 83 is on the left side of your view, 89 sitting down in the water a little bit further downstream. When I'm looking at this, that's an indication that 83 doesn't really consider 89 to be a threat. Uh, if, if he thought that 89 was a real threat, he would be turning and facing him. But then again, 89 gets beat up, or excuse me, 83, he gets beat up quite a bit. Uh, scars and wounds all over him. So maybe he's just not, not that clever when it comes to <laughs> resolving conflict peacefully or paying attention to his surroundings. Sometimes bears just walk up to him and claw him in the, beat, uh, in the bump. And that's how he's gotten a lot of those scars and wounds on him. I mean, I've always wondered about that with 83 because every year he seems to come back with so many scars and wounds. And, um, I, you know, I feel bad for him. But, but, yeah, maybe his judgment is not what it should be. Or maybe backpack is just not a big enough threat. And it is interesting to see these two bears in this same spot because both of these bears will fish in other locations. They'll fish... Uh, backpack especially, again, he's moving out of your frame right now. I'll zoom out a little so you can see where he's going. Backpack will fish the far pool. He'll also occasionally go into the, the plunge pool below the falls that we call the jacuzzi. Maybe that's his destination right now. We've mostly been uh, focused on these three bears at the falls during our broadcast here. Just to recap, if you're uh, joining us a little bit late, we have uh, all three adult males. Or all three of these bears are adult males. Those are the, the bears we're looking at in your frame right now. 812 on the lip of the falls, 89 backpack in the plunge pool below him, and then 83 closer to the far side. Brooks Falls often, at Naomi, is dominated by adult males. You're going to see adult, more adult males fishing brook falls than other classes of bears, whether that's adult females or uh, younger bears. A lot of times you have younger bears sort of hovering on the fringes of the falls. And we right. have, we're going to take a look at one of these that's just downstream of us here. Perhaps this bear is weighing uh, his options. I think this might be 8 to 1. I'm not 100% sure on it. I won't argue, I'm not sure. 
But, but this is a, a younger bear, certainly. And certainly can't compete in size to the, to the bears that um, we've been watching at the falls right now. You can often tell younger bears at a distance from the more mature adult males. If you're looking, again, just to identify whether that's you're looking at a male or a female or a mature adult male versus uh, an older teenage bear, those bears we call sub-adult bears. By, you can tell those differences by looking not only at their overall body size, but looking at how well filled in the bear is overall. Adult males especially have very thick necks in proportion to their body. The younger growing bears and the adult females tend not to have such thick necks. So they just don't have as much muscle mass or fat around uh, that, at the, that area of their body at this time of the year, I should say. Who are we, there, there are some bears downstream that we're seeing. Mike, I don't know if you can zoom right, in the or not. Brooks Falls isn't the only place for bears to fish. Downstream, about 100 yards, is a place that we call the Riffles. And the Riffles can be a good place to fish if you know where to fish. And also the salmon are running in, uh, in decent numbers. So in the middle of your screen, number 151 Walker, he's a big adult male. And behind him is a bear that I have not yet seen this year until this evening, and that's um, a young adult female, number 719. She had uh, two cubs last year, two yearlings to be more specific, and it looks like she has separated from them. So they're probably on their own. They may come back to Brooks River uh, this year. It's, it's likely they will, but they may disperse into new territory. That's a pretty slow process for newly weaned cubs to establish their own home range. So, so they often use a lot of what their mother's home range is during the first couple of years of independence. Uh, maybe 719 will come closer to the falls later in her broadcast so we can get a better look at her. But she's a young, a young adult uh, female and 151 walker in front of her. So we'll go back up to the falls here because uh, 89 Backpack didn't like his spot in the jacuzzi. 83 had vacated that spot on the far side near the, uh, near the rock for just a moment. Backpack wanted to move into there, did so, but then 83 is coming right back. So definitely some uh, continued posturing between these bears. They can almost be, in some ways, bears can be a, a, a bit childlike in their behavior. Because they will, you know, when you look at the falls, you look and say, well, there's space everywhere. They know they can fish in different places, but often they don't. But again, an example of how these bears resolve their differences peacefully, 89 just happened to yield and decide it wasn't worth trying to uh, push 83 out of that fishing spot. So 89 in the far pool of Brooks Falls over there. Salmon will often be circulating in there. Sometimes you'll see bears in the far pool just take a blind lunge looking for fish. Or sometimes they'll sit in a position against that rock wall and wait for salmon to swim in front of their face. And Naomi, we can't quite see what you're looking at um, on the camera. We'll, we'll, I think once that bear moves into the water, we'll get a really great look at it. Okay. But what might change everything about this evening? Yes, um, we have a, a, a new bear arrival that might, might change what we're seeing. And that is? And that is bear uh, 747 who is our largest bear. He is the current Fat Bear Week champion, but he also right now seems to be our most dominant bear. He has made 
Bear 856 stand down. And Bear 856 has been really the most dominant bear along this river for 10 years. So um, this is a very, very interesting year for watching the dynamics between these bears. And can, can you see him yet in the camera? Yeah, I just barely see him. He's going to be at your lower left corner. So that's bear 747, a true giant among brown bears. You're seeing other people in the view. We are on a public wildlife viewing platform. There's probably about 30 other people here with us at least. So if you hear other voices besides uh, Naomi and I, that's uh, to be expected. Uh, the, the wildlife viewing platform separates uh, people from bears. It allows more people to stand here and observe these animals and do it safely. And it also uh, consolidates people into a predictable location. So it's more likely that bears will get used to our presence and we're less likely to displace them. But 747 right now, just surveying his uh, domain, none of these bears that are currently at Brooks Falls will consider challenging him. So we can easily predict that if he moves into the water and wants to displace any one of these bears, he'll do so and those bears will easily get out of the way. And it looks like here he goes right now. Yeah. This is a giant of a bear, folks. So again, if you are not uh, familiar with 747, you should feel a little privileged to look at uh, a bear this size. Very few bears on Earth will ever grow as, as big as him. Average weight of an adult male in Katmai at this time of the year is seven to 900 pounds. 747 certainly exceeds that. Yes. And, and how much, last fall, Naomi, how much was he estimated to weigh? 14 to 1500 pounds. Yeah. Um, his belly dragged the ground um, and, and he's still not skinny. No, he's not. He has a ton of fat reserves. In other ecosystems where bears have to work harder for their food, bears go into the den looking like that, like 747. But this is July, and so he still has months to pack on uh, more fat reserves. So he'll, I think he'll definitely be uh, quite large in the fall once again. So one thing you're seeing with 747 right now are those um, that bear spots on his back. And that's his shed pattern. Those aren't scars. That's He has this very strange shed pattern. And now he's just placed himself in the jacuzzi, which is his preferred fishing spot most of the time. Yeah, he won't fish in the jacuzzi exclusively, but that's probably where he fishes the most, mm -hmm. at least at this time of the year. And especially since he doesn't have to worry about other, other bears displacing him from that spot. So he loves the jacuzzi. Notice how the other bears uh, didn't really react to his approach. They recognized that he wasn't, you know, challenging challenging them directly, and they were they were very keen to keep an eye on whether he was uh, going to move in their direction. Yeah. But the seven four seven decided, you know what? I'm just going to stick in the jacuzzi here. I don't need to necessarily uh, challenge these other bears. Although 83 is moving downstream, so maybe he was a little uncomfortable with the close proximity of 747. Yeah. 89 over there, again, sees that vacancy in, in one of his preferred fishing spots, so he's gonna try to creep over there ever so slowly. You see how slowly Naomi, he is walking in that direction. If yeah. 747 wasn't in the jacuzzi, I don't think we would see him using such caution. No, and he's been chased off this season by 747, so uh, he has reason to be cautious, and. We see 747 looking in 89's direction. So, um, yeah, and it seems like in the beginning of the season, the bear, a bear like 747 sometimes just has to make a point of being top dog. Absolutely, they will go out of their way almost to remind other bears who's boss. Uh, and those encounters become less and less necessary as other bears learn where they position themselves in the hierarchy. Now I want to pan downstream quickly here, Naomi, because oftentimes people wonder, well, do mother bears recognize their former cubs? Ah. And, and how do former cubs react to their mothers? Well, we have a situation kind of like that right now. Yes. In the ripples. So we talked about 719 earlier. Uh, she's the one moving upstream towards the falls, standing uh, mostly out of the water. Now her biological mother is uh, right behind her in the middle of your view. That is number 435, Holly. And Holly has a yearling cub this year. He's trailing behind. 
It's a lot harder for those yearlings to navigate the water. It really demonstrates how strong the adults are. Most likely these bears will probably just ignore each other. We won't, we won't see any like happy reunions or, or nuzzling <laughs> or anything like that. Although certainly bears have friends. I'm, I'm, from what I've been able to watch along the river and what we've observed on the cameras, there are certain bears that prefer the company of other bears and will go out of their way to greet other bears and play with them. Uh, but we don't really see that between mothers and their former pups. Now we have seen um, when 719 had her cubs, uh, we saw her fishing in the same area as her mother and her cub, but that cub is staying behind her mother. And I'm certain that these bears would recognize each other. Bears are extremely smart. Their sense of smell is extremely keen. So not only can they probably recognize each other based on just physical features, but also based on uh, their, um, their scent as well. So I, 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 I'm almost certain that 719 recognizes her former mother and vice versa. Yes. But they're probably more than likely than anything else just to ignore each other. Especially when food resources have been scarce like this. Yes. But it's interesting how close that cub is staying to mom here. It doesn't seem as comfortable as it as it is in other parts of the river, like the lower river or at the mouth of the river. Yeah, um, let's take a closer look at the family here. Because we haven't seen really any cubs on our broadcast so far today. And yearling cubs are uh, at this time of the year very lanky. Uh, they often look skinny. Not a lot of fat reserves on their bodies compared to the big adults. They are much, much bigger though than first year cubs. And first year cubs are darker, uh, often have like a, maybe a natal patch, like a white patch of fur or a lighter patch of fur uh, right on their chest or breast area. You can recognize Holly not only by her relatively blonde color, especially her blonde ears, but also she has light colored claws. They're not completely white, but they're, they're fairly distinctive. And Naomi, when you see a cub sticking close to mother like this, what does that in usually indicate about the family's, uh, the family's uh, mood at the moment? Well, tense. Um, I, I think Holly is being cautious. She's a very experienced bear. She's in her mid-20s. She's had several litters. Um, sh she's actually her, we, it's really a family reunion here because her son, 89 Backpack, is one we've been watching up at the falls. And um, her cur she's there with her current cub and then with 719. Yeah, so Holly actually has uh, more than one offspring here. So from three of her litters, she's had more, more to litters than that. But yeah, so we have the, the yearling that's with her right now. Uh, zooming out and panning a little bit to the right is 719 from a litter uh, in 2014. And then we'll go over to the falls here. And we've been looking at number 89 backpack fishing on the far side for much of our broadcast. And he was born in 2006 and Holly raised him until they separated in the spring of 2008. Now backpack is a successful adult and 719 is a successful adult. Uh, perhaps uh, Holly's little mini me over here <laughs> will also uh, you know, be a successful adult in a, in a few years' time. We hope so. But, and that um, mini-me um, can be quite brave and quite curious. So to see that cub sticking so close to mom is really indicative of how the, the obstacles that, that that cub is sensing right now. It's sensing mom's caution. The, the current is tough for that young, young bear. Um, and I'm not sure that young bear is sanguine about uh, 719. And another interesting life history note about that uh, Holly's yearling, yearling cub is the fact that it's, well, it's, its mobility is great. And last fall, uh, it had 
a lot of porcupine quills in one of its front paws, and a lot of people were concerned, you know, whether it would become infected or whether it was going to be able to recover from from that injury. But there doesn't seem to be, from what I've been able to observe while I've been here at the river, there doesn't seem to be any uh, long-term effects from all of those quills. So it's, it's uh, that cub seems that yearling seems completely healed. Yeah. Yeah, it's been very active. Puts full weight on that paw. So I am guessing that Holly decided this was not a lucrative fishing opportunity for her, given probably who is at the falls. Sometimes Holly will come closer to the falls, especially if there's more fish around. She'll fish in the far pool. She doesn't come here with spring cubs, but she will come here occasionally with yearlings, and she's much more likely to come here when she doesn't have any cubs at all. So bears certainly will change their behavior and their patterns of movement along the river depending on mother bears will do this, depending on the their reproductive status and how old their cubs are. So Holly is going to be a bit more likely to avoid the falls than she would if she was signal, single, but we'll still see her approaching the falls. And I think if we get more salmon coming up to the falls, she'll probably recognize that it's, it's worth the risk. But mother bears are always doing that. They're always weighing risk versus reward. The risk of Fishing at Brooks Falls can be quite high for mother bears and their cubs, but the reward is also can be exceptionally high too. Now 747 uh, moving out of the jacuzzi, and you can see how easily number 89 backpack is getting out of his way, not even giving it a second thought. And that's how most interactions between uh, dominant bears and subordinate bears resolve themselves. If, if you're keeping score at home, and I do keep score when I'm standing here at the river, I would note that interaction is number 89 avoids 747. So 747 didn't necessarily need to actively displace number 89. 89 recognized that 747 was moving in his direction and just got out of his way. And now 747 is moving to one of his other preferred fishing spots. This will give us a really good look at um, his size overall. We'll zoom in to 747. He is a giant bear. Now, that is a preferred fishing spot for him as well. And, and, and it's funny for me because I look at him there and I'm thinking how small he looks relative to his size in September when he fishes there. But he's no small bear now. Yeah, we're likely to see him fishing that exact spot in September. So the webcam sees him in that spot in July, take a screen capture, because you're likely to get that opportunity again in September and you can compare and contrast uh, his, his growth rate. Make you able to do that with um, number 812 is on, still on the lip of the falls. And there's that opportunity to compare and contrast bears in July and also in September really is what inspired the creation of Fat Derby and that event that we hold every year. So for those of, uh, viewers who are new to uh, the bear camps, you want to just briefly tell us what Fat Bear Week is? Fat Bear Week is a, a celebration of the success of bears here at Brooks River and it's your opportunity to choose who you think is the, the most successful bear of the, of the year here at Brooks River. So we take photos of not all of the bears, but um, at least a dozen bears, and we photos of them in July or June when they're skinning, and then we compare them uh, with photos we took of those same exact bears in September, so you can see the difference in body size. And then the public weighs in, the public votes on who they think was the most successful bear, and there's no one correct way, way to judge your vote. You can base your vote on any number of things, including uh, what circuit challenges that it faced throughout the summertime, like a mother bear trying to raise cubs. If she got fat uh, and she was raising cubs, maybe she deserves your vote. Uh, maybe you want to do it just based on sheer body size, and I think that's how 747 certainly won last year because he was just so giant. Uh, so, or you can, if it's an older bear that you want to vote for, because uh, oftentimes they face a lot of competition from younger bears. So but, there's lots of different things that you can base your vote on, and that's what makes. Um, 
the uh, tournament so fun. So starting, I think, September 29 this year is uh, our going to be our 2021 Fat Bear Week. Now the Bears don't know who won, but um, it is it is a fun time. Oh, you don't think it went to 747's head? I've been asked that question so many times <laughs> this week. You know, Otis is probably somewhere like oh, it never went to my head, and I won. I won three times. You know, 747 won, and he thinks he's a big man on campus. Well, but Otis is our Zen master, and so it wouldn't go to his head. Yeah, so the Bears received no reward at all uh, for winning Fat Bear Week, but it's a great way for us to consider the different ways that Bears get fat and why they get fat to survive. So that's the main point. It's really fun. I hope you're, um, you'll join us for Fat Bear Week coming up later this year. Now, 89 is, or excuse me, uh, 83 has circled around here. We haven't really taken a, a real close look at him so far. So maybe we'll try to zoom in on, on him a little bit. Again, blonde ear, blonde-ish ears, I should say, on, on 83 here. Very dog-like muzzle, muzzle to me. I mean, his face to me kind of looks like you would find on something like a pit bull or something like that. All the muzzle's a little bit longer. Uh, lots of scars and wounds around his face um, and neck, and especially on his hind quarters as well. That seems to be a spot where he frequently uh, gets attacked by other bears. Now, getting a little bit excited uh, excited to move in, into the jacuzzi there yes. because he's seen some fish jumping. Now, it will be interesting to see if 747 gets distracted by 83 being in the jacuzzi and may want to prove a point or may he just may be intent on fishing over there where he likes to fish. And again, 747 is the most dominant bear on the river this year. Naomi and I have a live chat plan for tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern time about the bear hierarchy. So we're going to be talking more specifically about the rules of engagement in the bear hierarchy and why that's important for brown bears to live within a hierarchy. Uh, so we'll hope that you'll join us for that. But in the meantime, yeah, 747, if he wants that spot, he's gonna come back and take it. 83 is likely to just avoid that area. The 747, you know, when you're as dominant as he is, like 856 has been in the past, you rarely acknowledge the presence of other bears. You just kind of go about your business. You do what you want to do. And that's the advantage of being a very dominant bear. But he had to establish that this season. He didn't just come here and say, okay, I'm the most dominant bear, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of work to achieve that level. You don't get as big as 747 without being very good at fishing. So you gotta be good at fishing. And then if you wanna be a very dominant bear, you also have to have some assertiveness. And that's something that he didn't have at the same level as our formerly most dominant bear, 856, in recent years. He would always yell to 856, although he, he had an assertive streak in him, but he never really threw his weight around as much as, as 856 did. But this year, he's really feeling good about himself. 856, for whatever reason, isn't feeling as strong, so he's unwilling to challenge 747. And 747 is reaping the rewards. He is an excellent fisher. He, he um... Now, do you want to talk a little bit about what, maybe what 8.3 is actually doing? I mean, it's not just sitting there, right? Certainly not. Let's, um, let's take a closer look at him in the jacuzzi here. Sorry for the shaky camera work. It's my fault. Okay, if you want to take the blame for it. I will. I was going to admit it was me, but I'm not. But... Oh, so 8.3, oh. paying attention uh, to 747's movement. 747 just moved a little bit. But maybe that was enough to make 83 uncomfortable. And now he's moving out of the jacuzzi. The jacuzzi is one of those spots where bears fish by feel, not necessarily by sight. So they're waiting for fish to bump into them. There's a lot of water, or excuse me, a lot of bubbles in that water. And it's difficult for the bears to see the fish there. So they're really trying to uh, fish by sight. And I'll pan down here, try to give you a look at 83. Get a, um, you can get a view of how light colored his claws are. So kind of like Holly, light colored claws. Look how scarred he is around his face and neck. 
And I'm not going to be able to really pan down any further than that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Mike can show you, but he's got a real significant fresh wound on his rear right leg. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of a look at that right now. He's had uh, pockets like that on him before. Uh, that, wounds like that are kind of common. So again, on his uh, right rear leg. So it looks ugly, it looks nasty. Bears do have a remarkable ability to heal from wounds like that. They don't seem very prone to infection like, like we would. If I had a wound like that, uh, and if I wasn't in the hospital, and I didn't get stitched up, and I was walking around in the water, laying in the dirt, doing all the things that bears do, I think infection probably would set in quite easily. And I'd have a difficult time recovering from that. But bears don't seem to have those, um, those same issues. Is there been much research done on that? I don't think so. They just seem to be, yeah, tough animals, well adapted to fighting off infection. Now, as we watch 8-3 heading back to the jacuzzi, and I don't know if he's in your frame, he is, uh, 747 is watching carefully. 83 go back into the jacuzzi. If only we knew what was in his head. <laughs> He's probably thinking, I'm a tank and no one should mess with me. <laughs> I'm the tank. <laughs> yeah, going back to, uh, again, fishing in the jacuzzi, we'll take another look at 83. If you see him twitching or reacting quickly, that probably means that a salmon bumped into him and he was reacting to that. So he's going to be waiting for the fish to hit him and he's going to try to pin the fish to his body or to the gravel at the bottom of the, of the river. And then he might reach into the, into the water with his jaws and pick it up. So he, he's not just sitting there letting uh, the water soothe his wounds. It's definitely a, an active uh, fishing style sitting in the jacuzzi there. It may not look like it, but they definitely have to pay attention to what they're doing. Well, 83 kind of got tired of that uh, quickly, so he's moving, moving out stage left here. Or maybe not. He seemed to react to something over there. I'm not yeah. sure if it was um, people on the platform or if he just decided to change his mind. I mean, he's not a bear that comes this side of the falls very frequently under the platform. I don't think I've seen Not as too. much as other bears. Yeah. Yeah, he'll, he'll wander over here, but certainly not as much as other bears. And that's um, something, you know, if you're watching at home, to pay attention to as well. Because, again, the wildlife viewing, or the camera, the Brooks Falls cam and the Falls Low cam are attached to the wildlife viewing platform where people stand. And certain bears won't approach the side of the river because they are not comfortable with the presence of people. So if you're considering visiting uh, Brooks River in the future, either this summer or later, definitely consider uh, being quiet while you're on the wildlife viewing platforms and remaining on designated trails and designated wildlife viewing platforms. If we consolidate into these predictable places, then bears are much more likely to uh, get used to our presence and learn to work around us. So we can give the bears more space to go about their business and survive in the river, as opposed to if we were spread out walking in the river, for example. Uh, today, someone asked about um, the fact, asked, said, well, 747 looked at the people on the platform, and um, he does that frequently. Um, he's, he's a bear that is, he'll, he doesn't mind being near the platform, but he's very conscious that there are people here and looks here frequently. A bear like 856 doesn't seem to look in this direction that much, but 747 is a bear that looks 
at the platform. It, each bear is an individual. Not only do they have individual fishing styles, individual temperaments, but they also have individual tolerances for the presence of people. The Brooks River is the most visited place in Katmai National Park. In 2019, before the pandemic, more than 14,000 people visited. And we may have similar numbers of, of people visiting here this year. 747 now moving across the river. You can see how strong the current is. It's actually pushing him a little bit downstream, which is saying something for such a big animal. 83, looking directly at 747, wondering, okay, when is it gonna be time for me to move out of the way? 812 though, smaller than both of those bears on the lip, uh, quite secure in his fishing location. He knows those other bears can't really climb up the falls and directly challenge him, and he has plenty of time to get away if they uh, approach too closely. Well, speaking of approaching. And that was just a little too close for 89, or excuse me, 83's comfort. So again, moving out of the way of 747. And those situations, examples like that, prototypical examples, quintessential examples of the competition that bears face on a daily basis. If you're not as big as 747, that's so few bears that they're all going to be displaced at some point in time from, from the fishing so being a dominant bear really kind of is a, like almost like a positive feedback loop. You get access to the best fishing spots. You don't have to worry about other bears displacing you from those fishing spots. You can you grow bigger while other bears have to spend more time avoiding you. I, I also think it, it speaks to the health of this ecosystem that so many bears can be so successful in getting fat for their six months of not eating and um, it's not just uh, the bear, bears like 747 or 856 the biggest bears but it's a population of bears here that can be successful because of this successful ecosystem so 747 moved to another spot and was soon successful He's now catching and eating a salmon. Not a very big one, although that's probably just because it looks small in his jaws. 812 has moved off of the lip of the falls and now is moving downstream. 83 has moved out of our line of sight behind the platform where I'm standing. Also happening, the gulls are getting excited. The bears are vectors they, uh, for other animals to take advantage of the salmon. A gull can't catch a salmon on its own. So it's going to scavenge fish that the bears behind or part of fish that bears leave behind. And without bears feeding on salmon here at Brooks Falls, the gulls would have to wait in, uh, for at least another month before they would have access to the fish. The salmon uh, are what's called semelparis. They're looking for a big word of the day, and that means that they die after spawning. They only, they only reproduce once and then they die. Unlike uh, a person is, or a bear, they're iteroparis, and they can reproduce more than once in their life. Is that been fed into the closed captioning? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what the closed captioning does with those words. I didn't teach it <laughs> those, those words before. So 747 now moving into the jacuzzi again. Prob probably his most preferred fishing spot. Interesting that 812 went to the other side where where the other bears have been fishing. Yeah, that niche is open right now. Uh, 
812, not as big as as 83 or 89 that were fishing over there before. So now he sees that maybe there's a chance to move through that area. And you can see 747 quickly rewarded. This will give us a great chance to take a look at him as he devours this fish. And try to center the view here for everybody and get and get close up, close up view. And that's also a favorite spot for him to eat his fish. Whereas 812 would go on that rock behind the lip of the falls, 747 likes to move away from the jacuzzi and turn his back to it and eat his fish right there. You can see 747 going after the skin first. That often seems to be maybe the easiest way for the bear to eat uh, a salmon. But they also will eat the salmon when they're uh, when they're selecting for the fattiest parts of the fish, they'll select that skin. 747 isn't eating the salmon nearly as fast as he ate the fish just a few days ago. So he's been he's been catching fish on a, on a, on a regular basis now. If this were to be his first salmon of the year or the first salmon of the day, we might see him eat his fish in, in less than a couple of minutes, but I think it'll take him a little bit longer. The record, by the way, I've seen a mother bear eat a salmon in about 30 seconds. Oh my goodness. A whole salmon, so five, maybe even large, five pounds or maybe even larger. Well, mother bears are expending a lot of energy, so they need right. to consume. Yeah, if you think those, those dudes that take part in the Coney Island hot dog eating contest are impressive, they have nothing on a brown bear, absolutely nothing. Seven four seven isn't without his, his tooth issues or dental problems. He has broken teeth. He, he is old enough to certainly have worn teeth, uh, but not as not as much as some other bears. But that's a very common ailment: worn teeth and broken teeth for uh, older brown bears. Yeah, because he's seven four seven is around twenty or twenty one. Yeah, he's he's close to that. He may be a little bit younger. Uh, he was classified as a sub adult bear. So again, a teenage bear in like two thousand. I think, if I remember right. Because that would place him about four years old at that time. So yeah, he's probably around 20-ish. We don't exactly know how old he, he is, but right around that age. And he has a fan club of gulls. Yeah, a bit of groupies there. But they like, they like all the bears. The bears don't seem to pay much attention to the birds. They ignore them for the most part. They don't like ravens. I don't know why, but... But they do t they tend do, to talk. Yeah, they do tend to react a bit more defensively towards ravens. And I wonder if that's because ravens can't compete with them for animal carcasses. That's my hunch. Okay. Because the same thing happens with, like, with, with wolves and ravens. Uh, like a group of ravens can, can eat much of a carcass in a day. So if we add, a, add an animal carcass like a moose or a caribou carcass, for instance, that a brown bear can't eat all in one sitting, if a brown bear leaves it alone, I suspect that ravens could easily come in and take away most of the meat and then leave the brown bear with very little. And that may be a reason why brown bears will end up covering up large animal carcasses with dirt and maybe protect it from scavengers. That's my hunch. I'm not sure. Though. Makes sense. I, but we, we don't know everything about brown bears. And we just have a couple minutes left in our broadcast, Naomi. You know, we've seen bears, uh, some of the bears satisfy their hunger. We've seen some of the bears uh, competing over fishing spots. Do you have any uh, takeaways from the last hour of bear watching? Well, I think it, it, it really showed us the uh, variety of um, survival techniques of bears in terms of avoiding conflict, um, getting to prime fishing spots, um, 
And certainly seeing uh, Holly and her cub is a highlight because that was a behavior that we had seen for the rest of the hour. Um, and to see bears actually catching fish now. We're beginning to see different fishing techniques and um, and maybe the bears won't be so hungry after a while. So this is a hopeful evening for me. It's, it's never, never the same watching brown bears here at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. World famous Brooks Falls. You can tune in every day and like Naomi was saying, see individual bears doing different things in different ways, demonstrating the different ways that they survive in this tough competitive environment. It's been a fun broadcast tonight, Naomi, so I'm glad you joined me for it. We'll be back online soon to host more play-by-plays and more live events. So tune in to this channel of, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, where Naomi will be talking about the brown bear hierarchy. And we're talking specifically about 7th during, during that podcast to discuss, uh, you know, how he... Mike... I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. What made this bear season so unique to you? What, what was so special about it? I was, I, I, this year. Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. What made this bear season so unique to you? What, what was so special about it? I was, I, I, this year, there were many things. It's kind of hard to choose, honestly. Uh, but this year with the exceptional amount of salmon. Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such a, a special thing. What made this bear season so unique to you? What, what was so special about it?